Hi everybody, Zeev Simon here. I'm the creator of Surgical Master. Welcome to this video. And hey, thanks for registering for the webinar. It's happening February 18th at 4 p.m. Pacific time. I'm gonna be talking about disasters in the aesthetic zone. And if you're watching this video, uh, you're probably registered already, but if you're watching it on social media or you don't remember registering, go to surgicalmasterwebinar.com so you can register and make sure to, to attend the webinar on February 18th. I look forward to presenting it. It's going to be a lot of fun with Dr. Dan Hagey from Canada, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. In the webinar, we're going to be talking about the aesthetic zone, which is always a tricky area to work in. Uh, lots of high expectations and demands by the patient, and you know, it's, it's kind of stressful, not just for the patient about to lose a tooth or more, and having all this work done, plus the expense and everything that is involved, it can also be very stressful to you, the surgeon, because you need to perform. You need to, uh, let's say, extract a tooth that is infected, and you need to do a good job cleaning out the infection and doing some bone grafting and an implant, and all of that has to look perfect because it's in the aesthetic zone. So the stakes are high, the stress is high, and what I wanted to show you in this presentation and in the webinar and future teachings is that if you prepare, you can take some of the stress away, not all of it, but you can take some of the stress away by analyzing the situation, having a really good plan, good communication with the patient, and also performing and getting a great result. So don't put too much pressure on yourself. Stay calm and composed. Be knowledgeable and methodical, and you'll see that these cases will work out just fine. Now, this patient presented to me uh, apparently with an infection around a central incisor, tooth number nine. And when she came in, I saw a draining fistula on the buccal aspect of tooth number nine, uh, closer to the midline. And there was also a very deep pocket, around eight, nine millimeters, again on the buccal surface, close to the mesiobuccal line angle. And this patient does not have any other perinola pockets anywhere. She's all uh, perinolally healthy, generally speaking. And when a patient has a localized deep pocket and a draining fistula, very often you're dealing with a fracture. Now, this patient was not symptomatic at all. She was concerned about the infection. So we need to get to the bottom of this. And the next step is to take a periapical radiograph and get some clues why this patient has an infection. <laughs> Look at it for a second, and what are we looking at? We, we're seeing obviously tooth number nine with root canal treatment, and we see a post. Uh, we see a periapical radiolucency, mostly on the mesial aspect of the root, maybe extending to the periapical area. And we see an angle of the root and a totally different angle of the post, which is obviously the source of this problem. So, you know, you're looking at a periapical infection, uh, you're looking at probably a root perforation or, or, or fracture of the root, and like Dr. Fugazano says, it's TFT, meaning it's time for titanium. It's time to extract this tooth, clean out the infection, and replace this tooth with an implant. But really what you're looking at is total disregard of the anatomy of the root while preparing the post space. And that's obviously unfortunate. Things happen, but they are preventable. And what we have now is a disaster in the aesthetic zone. And that's really the topic of this video. So if you're looking at the periapical radiograph and the clinical picture, there's a lot of things that you can learn just from that. You can learn about the condition of the buccal plate. If you're looking at the extent of the infection towards the mesial and the apical part of the tooth, plus the draining fistula, you can probably assume that the majority of the buccal plate is now missing. How much? We're going to find out. Uh, but it's definitely a disaster. It's going to be a, a pretty significant defect in there. I know that the extraction is going to be relatively simple, not too challenging. I know that the buccal plate is compromised and therefore, I'll have to reflect a full thickness flap, augment the area with bone and a membrane, and deliver some sort of provisional, which one we'll see in a second. I also know 
very, very likely I'll have to delay the placement. There's going to be a significant infection in the site. I'm going to be missing the buccal plate. And many times it's safer, more conservative, less problems by delaying the placement. So you can tell there's a lot of things we can learn just by spending uh, some time to look at the radiograph to assess the patient. And that will help you to create a good plan of action. It will also help you to communicate with the patient before the procedure, uh, predicting all these things that uh, are likely true. We'll see, we'll see this in a second. So what I encourage you to do is don't jump in and treat and, and extract a tooth and place an implant. Every case is totally different and require different treatment. So for this patient, I recommended taking systemic antibiotics uh, starting two days before the procedure. And the reason I'm doing that, I'm not trying to cure the infection. What I'm doing is allowing this fistula to close up and that's going to help me during this procedure. Now, some patients will take it the wrong way. They will feel better. They'll see that the infection is gone. They'll actually cancel their appointment. But you need to educate them that this antibiotic is just helping to alleviate some of the symptoms and help in the healing process. Now, I know it's a disaster, but one good thing is that tooth number nine that we're about to extract actually has a little bit more soft tissue on the buccal surface, which is a good thing because we know that once a tooth is extracted, we're going to lose some soft tissue and bone. And having some extra uh, is actually a great sign and, uh, and encouraging. So what is the best course of action? What should we do next? Try not to be dogmatic and treat every case the same. What I do, I define the goals of what this patient needs. This patient needs to have tooth number nine extracted and the infection debrided and cleaned out. That's really goal number one and it's very achievable. Goal number two is to place an implant. And for that purpose, we need to rebuild the site with bone. We know there's going to be some bone deficiency. And we need to place a provisional. Whether we're placing an immediate implant or a delayed placement, we need to arrange for some type of pr provisional for, for obvious reasons. So if you have the goals, you're not committed to do all these things together. I mean, you have to provide a provisional of some sort, but you don't have to extract and place an immediate implant. And if you place an implant, you're not committed to place, the, to place an implant provisional. Okay, so I wanted you to think in terms of goals, and then depending on the circumstances, you will decide what's ideal for the case. This type of thinking is also going to help you communicate with your patient and define exactly what you're planning to do. And you can let them know that the sequence of treatment will depend on a few factors, on the extent of the infection, on their healing, on what you see while performing the surgery. And patients do understand that there is a biological component that you cannot control, okay? So for this patient, like I mentioned before, the extraction process itself is very simple. You can use universal forceps and... Uh, as long as this tooth is uh, relatively intact, it'll come out because with a large periapical infection, the tooth has quite a bit of leeway to move out of the socket as opposed to a tooth that is fractured and the bone around it is intact. So I know this extraction process is simple, which it was. And then once the tooth is out, uh, definitely take a look at it and you can see the source of this disaster. There's a post-perforation through the root on the mesial aspect and that caused an infection uh, leading to the loss of the tooth, but that's, uh, that's history. So the next step is to assess the socket and debride it, use some spoon curettes. And what you'll probably notice as you're debriding the socket is that on the buccal surface, you're only dealing with soft tissue. Now, because this infection is relatively large, I typically reflect the full thickness flap. And in this case, you're seeing that I use two vertical releasing incisions. I'm sparing the papilla. I, I wouldn't want to damage the papilla on the adjacent teeth. And I'm reflecting a flap in order to clean out the defect and have good access, but also in order for me to regenerate this defect and place a membrane, a membrane beyond the margins of the defect. So once it's all clean, I like to count the number of walls and 
we, in this socket, we have uh, an intact palatal plate. We had mesial and distal, but the buccal plate was very severely compromised and was quite wide. So my rule of thumb is no buccal plate, no immediate implant. In my opinion, it's too risky, and my preference is to rebuild the site with bone and sometimes with soft tissue, get as ideal as I can, and only then place an implant and uh, not worry about initial stability and having some uh, you know, compromise to the final result. So that's my opinion. That does not mean that an immediate implant cannot be done and it's not going to work, but I think there is an element of risk that in these situations I don't like to take. So my preference is to graft a socket with particulate bone, uh, in this case an allograft material, where I'm going to be filling the defect, as long as there's good vascularity, which you can see there is, to the fullest contour of the original ridge. And if I had the chance to redo this case, I would probably overgraft. I would add some additional bone, account for, account for some of the bone resorption that we are expecting, add some platelet-rich fibrin or PRF, to enhance the results, which I didn't do in this case, and I think I could have done a little bit better. Now, in order to retain this graft material, both on the buccal and the occlusal surface, I used one membrane that I reshaped uh, to be fitting slightly over the defect on the buccal and to be folded on top of the occlusal part of the extraction socket, and that's mostly for retaining the graft material. And again, in hindsight, I now like to use a different method that is called the compartment grafting method where I graft each part of the socket separately. So I would place a membrane only on the buccal surface to cover the defect beyond the extent of the defect and on the occlusal surface I'll place some type of collagen sponge or a, uh, a PRF plug to keep both compartment, the buccal and the occlusal separate. First of all it's much easier uh, when you keep everything separate the membrane doesn't run away and it doesn't fold on itself and number two, it doesn't force me to get primary closure when I suture, which I did in this case. The occlusal part of the socket and the, and the ver vertical releasing incisions are, are primary closed because I needed to make sure that the membrane covering the buccal and the occlusal part of the defect is not exposed. And it's certainly doable, but at the moment it's not recommended. I actually recommend secondary intention healing for extractions leaving the occlusal part of the socket exposed with an X suture for a few reasons. Number one, you'll get better tissue quality, more attached and keratinized tissue. Number two, as the socket heals, and it obviously healed very, very well. If you're looking at, at it two months later, as it heals, look at the mucogingival junction. It's not where it used to be, and I think it's not ideal, and it's a totally a function of primary intention closure and using one membrane to cover the buccal and the occlusal part of the socket. So there's always room for improvement and we are all a work in progress. I'm going to talk more about this concept in the webinar on the disasters in the aesthetic zone. Now I let the site heal for a few months and I took a CT scan and the site healed very very well. I had uh, a really nice ridge that was ideal for an implant and the bone quality was also great. I'm not going to show you the implant procedure, it's not the focus of this video. I'm going to share the implant placement in a future video, but the procedure went well, I let the implant heal for a few months, and you can tell that we had pretty good soft tissue contours and good papilla that will allow for a good restoration that is naturally looking with good soft tissue around it. The only regret that I have is that I never saw the patient back for a follow-up with the crown. And I'm dying to see how it turned out. And I'm obviously not going to mention any names here on this video, but if you are the patient, you're recognizing yourself uh, in this video, uh, please come in. I'd like to see how everything turned out. Make sure everything is looking good and that you are in great shape. You're a great patient and I, I really enjoyed uh, treating you and getting to know you and thank you for the opportunity to treat you. It was a privilege. I hope everything is well with you. So this was a disaster, and I wanted to show you in this video how by looking at the patient initially, looking at the radiograph, you can predict many things. You can plan for the procedure. You can communicate with your patient. And when it comes to performing this procedure, 
you are more calm and prepared and everything is much more predictable. So I hope this video is helpful to you in the future when you're dealing with similar disasters in the aesthetic zone. In the next video, I'm going to talk about a different type of disaster in the aesthetic zone, a tooth with severe external and internal root resorption and how I manage the case. I look forward to seeing you at the webinar on the disasters in the aesthetic zone happening February 18th at 4 p.m. Pacific time. If for some reason you didn't register yet, uh, go to Surgical Master Webinar and I'll see you then. Hi everybody, Ziv Simon here. I'm the creator of Surgical Master. Did you ever have a real problem extracting a tooth in the aesthetic zone? Some teeth have severe fractures, bad resorption and infections, and you thought to yourself, boy, this is going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging. It's a real disaster. I'd like to invite you to a free webinar on how to deal with disasters in the aesthetic zone. It's happening February 18th at 4 p.m. Pacific time. In this webinar, I'm going to talk about the different challenges and disasters that I encounter in my practice and what are some of the solutions for that. It's going to be completely live Go to surgicalmasterwebinar.com to register for the webinar and get more instructions on how to attend. It's very, very simple. All you need is an internet connection, a computer, a tablet or a phone in order to attend. I'm going to be joined by Dr. Dan Hagey from Toronto, Canada. He's a real fantastic clinician in implant surgery with a lot of experience and I look forward to our interactions. Once you register, I'm going to send you some additional information and videos on different disasters in the aesthetic zone. I'm also going to ask you a few questions about your own dilemmas and challenges when it comes to extracting teeth in the aesthetic zone. I'm going to take your questions and incorporate them into the webinar. So we're going to have a great learning experience together. It's going to be live and interactive. I look forward to seeing you at the webinar on how to deal with disasters in the aesthetic zone. Go to surgicalmasterwebinar.com to register. February 18th at 4 p.m. Pacific time. I look forward to a great experience. See you then.